Good. Well, we're continuing our, our time in Proverbs this morning. I think we're coming to the end, actually, of Proverbs in maybe only another week or two. Um, and we're returning this week to the subject of work. Um, so I think we've got some slides at the ready, Dave. Uh, should be, if, this, if we were at school, we could have a little <laughs> test around this, because I think all, all of that we, we touched on in the last, um, the last look at this subject. Um, so we tried to lay some kind of foundational blocks for thinking about our work um, as we come into Proverbs. So the, the top four points on the, on the screen there were, were some of the sort of yeah, foundational levels upon which we sort of begin our, our thinking. So we pointed out that work was created and put into place by God before the fall, before sin entered, um, work was a good thing. Uh, we talked about us being in image bearers, so we're made in the image and likeness of God, and God is a working um, God. We also flagged up the fact that work is impacted by the fall. Part of the judgment in Genesis 3 immediately hit um, the, the work. It could be the environment. In Adam and Eve's case, it was the earth um, being cursed and the thorns and thistles and the, the struggle um, of their work, the sweat of your brow. Um, we're also all sinful people, so all of our colleagues are sinful as we are sinful. Um, so there's that going to be a difficult sort of element to our work as well. Uh, we also said that work was more than simply the stuff we get paid for or a salary for. Um, some of some sporting people in the room, you know, that's part of work, isn't it? In a team and working for the same goal it can be voluntary work, the work of parenting, the work of marriage, the work of friendship. Um, so it's broader than that. It's more, we're more thinking about our attitude um, as we go about life here. Do you remember last time we talked about um, Susan's big fat commentary that talked about two different Hebrew words for hands? So the lazy hands was the, a word that goes from the wrist to the fingertips. We talked about like a weak sort of handshake or slack hands. And then the diligent hands in, in that verse on the screen uh, was from the elbow to the fingertips, so a much stronger kind of diligent hands. And that proverb there, and we, a lot of the proverbs we looked at last time were around this sort of idea that lazy hands or laziness ends to a sort of a, or leads to a poor outcome um, or poverty or, or not really producing things, whereas diligent hands on the whole doesn't always like this, but generally speaking, diligent, strong hands uh, bring wealth or bring good things. Um, so again, wisdom and folly we saw at place. And then I think we ended that, that morning looking at this verse from Colossians 3, um, where Paul had written to people um, in, sort of working as, as servants, having a wage, but freedom was limited and so on, and essentially said to them, whatever you do, as a great principle for all of us, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord um, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. And then this sort of thing that I think we can add as a fifth, fifth thing onto the list of things about work is that it is the Lord Christ you are serving. So the fifth thing on that list would be that all of our work is for the Lord. So I know it's as ridiculous as it may seem, but as you're running around the, the, the field with your teammates around you, you, you are running, you are working as for the Lord. When you enter into school tomorrow morning, bright and, you know, looking forward to a fresh week, in this wonderful establishment, you're going as a servant of the Lord. It's the Lord Christ you are serving. Just as we go into tricky work situations, perhaps tomorrow, it's, it's him who our eye is on. That's our framework. So that was sort of the, the kind of broad brush strokes that we touched on last time. And today we're going to be, on, on the next slide, meeting this character in Proverbs um, called the sluggard. And there is a special word, I don't know if any of you have switched on this morning, there is a word, isn't there, for, that describe words that sound like what they are? Does anybody know that? that do you know what I mean? I, there is a technical word for that. And I just think this is one of those, isn't it? The, you say, say the word slowly, you know, sluggard. It actually sounds like what it is. Um, I looked at one or two... Uh, Bible translations in the week. Some translations, instead of putting sluggard, they go for loafer. Um, and I don't know, Annika, whether this is one of the, the American translations, but they go for slacker. So it sounds like more of an American phrase. Some go for a slothful person. Uh, but I do like the sluggard. Um, it just tells you everything you need to know, doesn't it? I, and it would be good to keep this in mind. I was thinking about the syrup. I don't know if it's golden syrup, but it's some sort of syrup that 
just does not want to leave, leave the tin. Do you know what I mean? You sort of hold it up and just wait. And it just does not move. And then there's the beginnings of the tiniest little bit moving down the edge, but just, just so sluggard and slow. And then, and you'll see this on the, on the screen um, in a second, that you know, when it eventually decides to begin to leave the tin, you know, you could wait for hours then as it's sort of draining out. But then you've got that stuff, haven't you, the syrup on the bottom of the tin that is not going to go anywhere. Like you're not going to empty this entire thing. And that sort of gives you a feel. This character of the sluggard crops up throughout Proverbs. And it's that he or she is a deliberately a comic figure. Um, you're supposed to laugh at the sluggard. So when we're going to see one or two Proverbs this morning, we are supposed to laugh. Uh, is that sort of comic figure, and yet tragic. So it's almost that laughter that then just ends with the, you know, how awful, this is terrible. Um, and the, the whole thinking in Proverbs is we're to look at the sluggard and we're to long to be the opposite. We're, we're to learn from to be the very opposite. So what I've done this morning, and I'm, I'm going to go quite rapidly over these, I've tried to put in red the lesson that we're to learn from the sluggard. So in red, the, the heading is what we're to aspire to. You know what I mean? You look at that sort of comic, tragic figure and aspire to be completely different. So let me just take you for, through four of these quick, two on this slide, two on the next. Um, wi wisdom, and remember Proverbs is wisdom, God's wisdom appealing to us, is appealing for us to be somebody who gets started, gets cracking doesn't hang about. Um, more hair, less tortoise. So I don't want to, you know, that's a bit risky, isn't it? Because it's the tortoise who's the, the wise one in this thing. But, you know, when we're starting a task or starting our work, whatever aspect of work it might be, we're to be somebody who gets started, gets cracking. Um, look at the verses on the slug. How long? And I'll put the emphasis in bold there because I think that's the sense with which the speaker speaks. How long will you lie there? You sluggard, when? When will you get up from your sleep? Chapter 6, verse 9. Um, again, like that syrup, that, that when is this thing going to make an appearance? When is it going to leave um, the, the, the tin? That's the sense with the sluggard. I, I, and do, I, I'd love you to butt in this one. I was trying to ask asking somebody yesterday um, if there are any characters, TV, films, books, that just screams sluggard at you. So if someone comes to mind at some point, just sort of put, yeah, put a hand or, or yell. But, you know, as a door turns on its hinges, so a sluggard just turns on its bed. And I don't think this is simply having a go at people that sleep a good, you know, 10, 12 hours a day. It's the idea that they never get up. They never start. They never start anything. Similarly, secondly, diligence gets the job done. That's what we're to aspire to. And, and this is brilliant, isn't it? Just imagine your, your packet of Doritos, your Mexican dips. A sluggard will bury his hand in the dish. He'll even load up the salsa. But he's too lazy to bring it back to its, 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 his mouth. And it's just sort of almost laughably ridiculous. And the problem at the bottom of that slide... The lazy don't roast any game, but the diligent feed on the riches of the hunt. The, I think, again, reading some of the commentaries on this, the lazy have, they've caught something, so they've got their game, but they just don't get round to roasting it. It's that, that, that same image of the, the hand in the dish, that too lazy to come back to the mouth. In other words, the slugger just never finishes anything. Um, we'll, we'll eventually start something, but we'll rarely actually finish it. Just sort of loses interest along the way. Don't be like that, says wisdom. Get the job done. See it through to completion. I've written here, be more Bob the Builder. I think I didn't... The scarecrow in Bob the Builder, what, anyone know the name? Remember the name? No. I think it might have been Spud or something. I, yeah, here, I think full of you know, mad ideas, crazy schemes, or sent to do jobs, just never completes it. Um, so diligence gets cracking, diligence gets the job done. We're not to be like the sluggard in that. Let's go to the next slide, two more. Diligence doesn't make excuses. And these, again, just laughably comic. The sluggard says, there's a lion in the road, a fierce lion roaming the streets. 
And then they get the similar quote on another proverb, you know, I shall be killed, says the sluggard. It's, I don't know whether the dog ate my homework sort of originated here um, with, with the sluggard. It's sort of, you know, it's just a ridiculous excuse. Um, it, you've got elements, haven't you, of blame with the sluggard as well. It's the lion's fault. Um, you know, it, some, someone else or something will cause me harm, so I couldn't do the task you've asked me to do. But it's that sort of makeup. You can, you can get it, can't you? They haven't started tasks. They don't really make a start. If they do make a start, they never actually finish it. So there's then the need to cover, to make excuses, to blame somebody else, to cover for the lack of work. So some of the stuff we touched on in, on speech earlier in the series will come into play for the sluggard because they've got to kind of cover over or excuse themselves so the sort of lying lips or the blaming others is, is sort of surrounds this sluggard character. But diligence isn't like that, doesn't make excuses, make, tries to get a start, tries to finish things, honest lips rather than lying lips, uh, all these things sort of working together. Um, and then finally, diligence walks the walk, um, whereas the sluggard is a talker. Um, Mere talk. Talk's a great game. Um, or fantasies on that middle prof- uh, proverb at the bottom. Um, some work hard and receive abundance of food, but others chase fantasies. Or they're more into gambles, we said, sort of gambling that something's going to pay off. But anything really to just avoid hard work. And then funnily enough at the bottom, a sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven people who answer discreetly. So sluggards, weirdly, are armchair experts. Uh, they never leave the chair. It's one of my favourite images from one of the Harry Potter films. Was, was it Slug, Slughorn, who comes to be recruited by Dumbledore, and he just sort of blends in, becomes a ch- big, fat chair sitting there. And that's the sluggard, just sits there, never gets up. If he does get up to do something, he never actually finishes the task. If someone challenges on him, he'll have an excuse ready or blame something else. And yet all the time, the sluggard is very wise in their own eyes. So their garden may be a complete mess. They never do anything in the garden, or if they start something on the odd occasion, they'll never finish it. But they'll happily pose over the fence and give advice to their gardener about what they, or their neighbour, what they should be doing with their garden. So it's an interesting sort of package Uh, that the sluggard is. You can imagine, can't you, two colleagues. Uh, One, hardworking, bringing a profit, bringing gain. The other, simply a talker. Says all the right things, will even advise the colleague, but doesn't actually produce anything. You can imagine perhaps a couple of parents, one working hard, the other says the right things, but just doesn't really get stuck in. Or two friends. So that's the, the sort of the example of the sluggard in these four areas. Um, think about that syrup again. Never really gets moving in anything. And if they do finally get moving in something, they rarely land in the bowl to make the cake. There's never really any produce. Full of excuses. A good talker, but doesn't really walk the walk. But wisdom would urge us in Proverbs to be the complete opposite of that person. And again, you might want to think, keep in mind the various areas within which uh, we work. Be a starter, be a finisher, um, speak honestly, avoid excuses and, and walk the walk. Seems to be the wisdom from Proverbs. And on the next couple of slides, there are some consequences um, of these things. As you sort of scan through Proverbs, you begin to see really the outworking of of this approach to work um, and life. So I'll let you just take that in for a second. This is where I begin to feel a little bit sad, actually, for this this character or these sort of traits. A sluggard's appetite is never filled, but the desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. Um, This character, this comic character, does have appetites. They do have desires. There are things that they kind of want, 
things that they want to see happen or things that they want to see sort of achieve, but the, 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 the appetite is never filled, it's never satisfied. And it's never satisfied because they don't start anything. They continually turn on their bed. Um, they, they, they never finish anything. They, they, they have an appetite or a desire and they might start something occasionally, but they never actually see it through to completion. And this sort of takes us back to the foundational blocks at the beginning. Work is a good thing. It's something God has designed for us to do. It's, it's part of our makeup. We're made in his image and in his likeness. So when we work, when we see things through, we, we actually have things to tick off. We're productive. We achieve things. We're in tune with creation. We, we have the, the, the rewards, as it were, of our work and our labor. But a sluggard never really gets that. I suppose, in a way, you get stuck then on a kind of ever um, sort of circling treadmill that they have a desire or appetite. They never really start something. If they start it, they don't finish it. So they're never fulfilled, never satisfied, and so they don't bother. And so it's just this horrible kind of hamster wheel. The cravings of the sluggard will be the death of him or her because his hands refuse to work. Craving, but never actually enjoying. So there's something about being a sluggard. Has anyone thought of a sluggard yet? A book, TV, film? Anybody watch Park, Parks and Recs? This isn't a good example, but there's a bloke called Andy in that that's sort of, um, yeah, is, is a little bit like this. Um, yeah, Dan. Uh, Homer Simpson, yeah. I've not seen much of The Simpsons, but t- tell me a bit about him. How's he like this? Okay, just sitting there, doesn't do his work. Yeah, yeah. So there is something about sort of diligence and hard work that, that actually is, it's, it is fulfilling. So the desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. There's something about being somebody that sees things and, and wants things and longs for things that there can be a degree of satisfaction as, as we work hard um, at, at those things. And there's something at the end there we saw, I think, when we were looking at wealth, that the righteous give without sparing. There's a sense in which those that, that do work hard, those that make a profit, then have something to share, something to give, which blesses the receiver and the giver. So you can see, sort of see God's, God's good design in these things, that, that diligence fulfills. It's good for us and it's good for others. Speaking of others, I think on the next slide, diligence does have a benefit to other people. Um, If our attitude is is to work hard and to do things well and see things through, benefit for us, but benefit for others. And um, this this proverb 10.26 was quoted by someone in the church when we did this topic. Do you remember they talked about the colleague that is just sort of dependable, give them a task, they see it through, they do it well. And then the person that, that just never, never seems to be doing what they're asked or they talk a great game. But, and, and the person in that email quoted this proverb as vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes. So are sluggards to those who send them. I don't know. Let me ask you again. What, have you ever had smoke in the eyes or stood over a bonfire? How does that feel? How would you describe it? Stings. Painful, sort of. You sort of look away, don't you? Sort of eyes watering, and um, so again, this using this sort of image. I, I, I don't know about the vinegar to the teeth. I mean, again, reading one of the commentaries, they were saying that the vinegar to the teeth is an illustration of smoke to the eyes. So I think they're supposed to be picturing the same sort of thing. I don't know if it's a sour taste or whatever it is, but this is describing the person who works with the sluggard or sends them, sends them on a task, gives them something to do. And because of the way they go about it, it's like smoke to the eyes of the one that sent them. It's, it's an irritant, it's unpleasant, it's, it's difficult. Um, whereas, of course, diligence doesn't do that. Diligence is the opposite. Diligence brings joy. Um, diligence is productive, but the, the sluggard is unproductive. You have to have to redo the task because the sluggard hasn't done it. So it's a pain in the workplace. If the person's not done what you've asked, you've now got to do it yourself or get somebody else to do it. It creates more work. 
There's a sense of being unreliable or unproductive, but diligence benefits others. Diligence is productive and reliable and helps others. There's almost a team going on in that second proverb. One who is slack in their work sort of goes with or is brother to one who destroys. So the sluggard who's slack, who doesn't really do the task and brings smoke to the eyes, has to be redone. They, they bring, in a sense, destruction or, or difficulty. People talk about team morale, the, the effect that somebody can have who doesn't actually fulfill the task and creates more work. Um, again, sporting-wise, the person not pulling their weight. The team has to carry them. They're not really contributing. It, it sort of picks away at team spirit. But diligence benefits others. It brings strength. And then finally, another consequence, diligence produces re- results. And this is, for me, this is the saddest proverb of them all. Sluggards do not plough in season, so at harvest time, and this is, how sad is that? They look but find nothing. You'd think the sluggard would not plough in season, so at harvest time, they just stay in bed because they know there'll be nothing, but not in this. The sluggard doesn't plough in season, so at harvest time, they look, but find nothing. It's almost like that wishful thinking that somehow, even though they've stayed in bed, they don't work, they don't start, they don't finish, they're still hoping somehow there'll be something, but they find nothing. All hard work brings profit, 1423, but mere talk leads only to poverty. It's, it's unproductive. So it's a really sad picture. You see, you, I don't know if you get that sense. You, you look at the, the sluggard, you know, dip, hand in the dip, loading up but can't be bothered or turning on their bed or not completing anything. There's a lion in the streets. You, know, you start laughing And then at the end, you see that they're unfulfilled, or this way of being is unfulfilling for them. It not only is neutral in its effects on others, but it actually has a negative, difficult effect on others. And it just doesn't produce anything. It's just really sad. Um, Which, as I say, I think that's how the character works um, in the book. So I want us just this morning just to finish with the last slide. and I'd love you just, just to have a little look at that. That's a summary of where we've just been in the last few minutes. And we said that work can be not just paid employment, but you may want to think, you know, this coming week, if you're going into a place of paid employment, you've got, you've got wisdom and folly in front of you on the screen. Wisdom calls us towards diligence. Folly would cause us, call us towards laziness. If you're heading into school or college this week, have a think about what that might mean on the screen. Uh, Annika's helped us to think as well about church, family. Um, I was thinking this morning, church, church. It's funny, isn't it, how we, we easily begin to think church is something we go to or something that sort of, oper- you know, potentially may take a bit of time on a Sunday morning, maybe a little bit of time at a growth group, maybe certain special events. But we we think about church in terms of those contact points. But in a sense, church is something that we are all the time. So we are church family. It's not like we switch on church family at 10 on a Sunday morning and then switch it off at 12. We always are church family. So in terms of the, our work as a member of this family, um, what might diligence look like? What might laziness look like? So let's just, just take a minute just to glance through, and it'd be good to think, what, what are the perhaps one or two things to take away and pray um, about? What? I should also say that... Um, um, being in a family where neurodiversity is a thing, I think we also need to be a little bit careful here because somebody who, um, for example, might have ADHD, um, they, they are possibly some of the most productive people I know. 
because their capacity to be doing so many different things is just mind-blowing. So they often will make a big start and be really productive. But one of the difficulties about ADHD is that you can be, you know, doing one thing one moment, and then a second later, this thing becomes the big thing, and then this thing becomes the big thing. And I think we should be careful not to then label this person as a sluggard because they don't finish a job. You know, they do finish jobs, but it's, it's more difficult. There are challenges. Um, yeah, Karen often talks about a sort of a, a, mic, a, a, a kind of a stir fry and a roast dinner brain. So our brains can be different. I think we need to think a bit about that as well. Stir fries made very quickly, just bang, bang, bang. Roast dinners take a few hours. Um, apparently, I have a roast dinner brain. That's supposed to be a good thing. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to be able to function very well in a stir fry situation. Other people are very quick, very, you know, like that, but may actually find the sort of patience over the long term on something more challenging. And we need to be careful that we don't just sort of label, the, label this person as sluggard or that person, or label ourselves as sluggard. I think we need to take all of these things in. We've got a broad picture of a sluggard here, um, turning on the bed, hand in the dish, can't be bothered, makes excuses, covers, um, talks a good game, doesn't really ever do anything, is unfulfilled, doesn't really benefit others. So there's a big rounded image of the sluggard. But I think, yeah, let's be, be careful. We're all very different um, as well. But yeah, one, one or two thoughts just on, for you. Yeah, what, what, what is it that jumps out of, at, at you f from this? Um, is it something for you as a, a Christian in the workplace? You know, how we approach our work is part of our witness, isn't it? You'd, you'd hope that people at work would, would think, goodness, that person is different in the way that they work or the, the way they start things, the way they finish things. They don't cover and make excuses. They're honest. They, they, they walk the walk. They're genuine. They benefit those around them. Um, I can send that person because I know that they'll, that they'll do their best to do a good job. You know, it's part of our witness in the workplace, part of our witness in the family to be like that. But where's the challenge for you? We're going to have a second in a minute to, to pray. If it's me, Luke, sorry. Um, and I think the thing just to bear in mind as a final thought is that, you know, we are, we're works in progress, aren't we? The spirit that God has placed within us is making us more like the Lord Jesus. And it's a work in progress. Um, and there may be something that the spirit challenges us on this morning or encourages us in this morning to, to grow us. And, and to conform us to his likeness. So let's just, let me just leave a, a minute or so just to, to pray. Um, maybe ask God what it is in particular uh, that he would have us pray about and work on. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the Lord um, Jesus, your son. Thank you that, uh, Father, you, you, in a sense, didn't just stay up in heaven, as it were, sort of sending out instructions um, but that you came and that you lived and, and you've shown us. Thank you um, for Jesus working as a carpenter. Um, Father, we uh, imagine from Proverbs that he, he was someone, uh, Lord, that, that got on with things, uh, that didn't sit around, someone that finished the jobs he had to do, uh, somebody who didn't have to cover and make excuses, uh, somebody that, that sort of put into practice what he, he preached. Uh, we thank you, Father, for the way his work would have benefited um, those around him and, and, the, and, the, uh, and been productive, Lord, in just a very real, ordinary kind of carpentry way. Um, but we thank you, too, that Jesus in his ministry was, was these things, too, Lord, and often grew tired, uh, often had to, to find time to rest and to pray, um, but was, was hardworking, uh, Lord was was determined to go from one place to another to tell people of you to do the works that you've given him to do. We thank you that Jesus didn't ever leave anything half done. Uh, Lord, an encounter with a person, Lord, was seen through to the end. Um, and yeah, we just thank you, Father God, for for the way that he came to do the work you had given him to do, and and that Lord, he saw that through to the end. Lord, despite the uh, suffering and the kind of rejection uh, from people, the kind of desertion of his disciples, that he was single-minded 
to complete the tasks that you had given him um, to do. And we thank you that his diligence, uh, his hard work, his faithfulness, uh, Lord, produced great benefit for, for others, for us in this room. Um, and Lord, the, the, yeah, the outcome, the fruit of his labours, Lord, we are still to see the full glory and extent of that. And Father, we pray and give you thanks for that. And we pray, Lord, as we go into a, a fresh week, that you would help us again on this topic. Uh, Lord, protect us from sort of just switching off. Um, Lord, the moment coffee passes the lips, um, but actually, Lord, to go into this week, Lord, seeking your help to be more like the Lord Jesus and wanting to grow in diligence in all of our work and the aspects of our work. Uh, Father, help us not to be content to stand still uh, in that sense, but Lord, that we would um, grow, uh, Lord, in, in, in our work. Help us, we pray, to be diligent and hardworking in all the different aspects of our lives that you've called us to. Help us to be those that benefit others around us and are not smoke to the eyes of, for, for them, uh, Lord, but that we would be fruitful and helpful uh, and useful. Help us to grow as members of this church. Lord, help us to, to learn from Jesus what it means to serve others uh, and to lay our lives down for him and for others. And uh, Father, we pray that you would uh, prosper us in our gospel work for you, Lord. May our desire to reach out grow. Um, Lord, may our commitment and sacrifice to reach people grow. And would you build your church, um, Lord, in this place. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.